Hi, everybody. I'm here to talk to you about the idea of APIs, the idea of reactive, the idea of microservices, and specifically a project um, that I've been uh, working on for a, a couple of years with a variety of organizations um, that I want to present to you. Um, I am a, uh, a consultant, uh, freelance, been working happily freelance for a good long while, um, and I recommend that as a life. Um, wage slavery is not the way, guys. So, um, I currently do quite a lot of things. That's my desk at the moment, uh, working on a bunch of electronics. Um, if you've never melted metal with other metal, I strongly recommend it. Um, it's very therapeutic, but do fit an extractor fan. Solder fumes are bad for you. Um, I'm going to start with a question, and this is not rhetorical. What is this thing called the microservices architecture? Who would say I'm building microservices? We've got takers, takers, some, some takers, you, you, you're not really into this, are you? Um, right, okay, Mic what is microservices? Someone give me an answer. Don't make me have a conversation with myself. I'll happily do it, but. It's separate components talking to each other. Separate components, good. <laughs> Ooh, that's a good one. Not, not had that one before, an M so an MVP. Logically separate function? The Tell the truth. You're just stringing words together now, aren't you? <laughs> That's my <laughs> Yes? A service-oriented architecture in which the services are very small, compact, and self-contained. Okay, so self-contained SOA, mini SOA, if you like. Okay, so I've asked this question in four continents to many, many people. Um, and we get all kinds of interesting answers. Someone was claiming that uh, last week um, that an S3 bucket fits the criteria for, um, for a, being a microservice. It's self-contained, it owns its own data, it's blah, blah. He gave a really good definition, it worked really well. Um, not something that probably most people would recognize, but uh, I, I thought it fascinating. There was other things like uh, a small web service with a bounded context. That's one of the popular ones, one of the common phrases that people use. There's lots and lots of definitions. What I found was that no one actually agrees. If we line all of these things up next to each other, there is no common agreement that you can discover. I'm a, I'm a microservices consultant. You know, you'd expect me to come up with a, a wit, witty definition of what microservices are. I, I can't. You know, that was my conclusion. I've asked this question to so many people, there is no common set of definitions that fit everything that, that people are calling microservices. There isn't a definition. So this kind of made me, made me sad because you know, if we can't define it, if we can't say, well, do microservices by doing A, B, and C, how can we build it? This doesn't seem to make sense. So this was something I've been pondering. For a, for a good long time. And so I looked at my data again, because being a good developer, I wrote down what people said. And I noticed that there were actually, there were two things that everyone was agreeing on, everybody. And they were not quite what I expected. So the first one, isolation. There is always some form of isolation that you're introducing into a system. Everyone seems happy with that as an idea. You know, whether you are um, defining it as logical separation or physical separation, um, whether you're using a network or something else, there's always some sort of, we're going to take our system and pull it into bits. The other aspect is um, odd. It's, and, and, and everybody has it, uh, unless they're a complete and utter cynic, uh, which is what I can only call this aspirational quality. You know, and it's uh, this kind of deep deep emotional connection to, we're going to pull our system apart and the world will be better. We're not quite sure how, but the world's definitely going to be better. So this seems to be kind of common to all microservices deployments. Everything else varies. So the route between isolation and aspiration, it's different for everyone. And that's kind of part of the problem, but certainly this is informative. Now, as a consultant, I can sell this. This is quite good. I can go into the room, wave my hands, and say, microservices are awesome. You know, you break your system apart. The world will be better. There's my invoice. Go. Um, and, and this is quite a comfortable thing for me to do as a consultant. Uh, as a technologist, 
this is horrific. You know, this is, this is not something that you can build. Um, and so this has led to all kinds of strange things, like somebody last week telling me that an S3 bucket fits the definition of being a microservice. And actually, you know what? I think I agree with him, because the definition is so utterly debased um, by all of these different ideas as to what microservices are. So what do we do? What can we do with this? You know, if we can't define microservices except for my ropey isolation aspiration thing, what do we do? Well, I started with a phrase which was the microservices architecture, and that's what people often use, less so now, but certainly when it kicked off four or five years ago, everyone always said it just like that. We are going to apply the microservices architecture to our system. So, I have another question. What's architecture? Would anyone self-identify as an architect? We have one? Just the one? So what do we think architecture is? This is not rhetorical. Anyone want to have a go? This is not an ambush. Planning the, the, planning the design of some sort of system or product. OK. Anyone else want to have a go? Designing structures, yeah. So a follow-on question. Is it the same thing as software design? No, maybe, yes, no. No one's willing to commit because they sense an ambush. And, and you're right, this is totally an ambush. So I think I can prove that they aren't the same thing um, simply by counting what's going on. So if you look in a piece of software, you will go through and see all the design decisions that went into it. So you'll see, should we use an if? Should we use a switch? What should we call this method name? Should we use classes? Should we do this? Should we do that? And uh, there are many, many design decisions that you can make. And if you were to go into, uh, say, be given the same problem six months apart, you would design it differently. You know, it would be different. It would do the same job, hopefully, but how you actually built it, the design, would be different, even if it's subtle. So there appears to be a limitless amount of design decisions that you can make. Um, everyone coming to the same problem will design things differently. Uh, no one is going to generate the same piece of code for the same problem, unless it's utterly trivial. So we have an unlimited number of design decisions. Architectures, you know, if we try and pin this down and say, well, what is an architecture? Well, we don't have an unlimited number. You know, we have a limited number of architectures. We even give them names. So they must be limited. It might be a large number. It could be thousands. It's probably not. It's probably smaller than that, but it's still limited. So we, we talk about things like N-tier architectures. Um, we talk about things like SEDA, messaging. You know, all of these architectural decisions, they have names, so we can count them, which means they can't be the same thing as design simply from, from the point of view of cardinality. So they're obviously closely related, but they aren't the same thing. So we follow on. What is architecture? You know, we can, we can totally define this. So in my view, and I'll give you my opinion, um, architect, a good architect, and I've worked with a few good ones, I've worked with a few bad ones. The good ones, what they do is enable developers to create a mental model of the system so that they can create effective designs. They, uh, give, they are the guides of the system, the storytellers, the narration. So they allow developers to understand what they should be doing. They enable developers to make good decisions and make, uh, make it harder for them to make poor decisions. So they aren't doing the designing. That's what software devs do when they go and actually write some code. And they may be the same person. You know, I would expect an architect to write some code. But they're doing a different role. They're performing a different, different thing in the system. So I know a lot of those things from another field. A lot of those things that I've just said. So creating mental models that you can use to engage with the world, create solutions, take problems, engage your mental tools that the architect has given you, and create a solution that, it, that is correct for the system. Um, all of those things, all of those kind of discussion, I know from the world of philosophy. And that's effectively what we're doing when we're talking about architecture. We're creating a philosophy, a mental model, a set of mental tools that you can use to approach a problem and do it consistently and do it right. 
Um, that's what we're doing in software when we talk about architecture. So, we talk about microservices, microservices architecture. If you follow my thread, we have this word that um, is essentially a, a set of principles, isolation and aspiration, and then we have architecture, which in my view is philosophy. It's a mental model. It's a, something that you use to approach a problem and come up with a consistent right solution. So that kind of fits, I think. You know, we have a, a mental model, a philosophy, a software architecture that emphasizes change. That's what people always want. When they say aspiration, what they're actually saying is, I want to be able to change my things. I don't want to have to spend six months changing one line of code because someone made a mistake six years ago. I don't want to do that anymore. I want to be able to change my things when I want to change them. And that's the kind of the thing that appeals to people with microservices, you know, evergreen systems. Um, that's the kind of thing that they'll say. And so we have a, a software philosophy that emphasizes change. That's what microservices seems to be. Um, lots of people will put their prescriptive, this is what microservices are, and this is, this is your 10-step your um, plan to get there, which is fine. I don't care. Um, because someone else has got a different five-step plan, and it's probably just as good. Um, the fact that it disagrees it doesn't matter, because fundamentally, it's going in the same direction. You just pick one. So, this is what I believe microservices are today. The problem, and this is a problem, is that this is not a way of designing software, as we've established. There is no prescriptive design here. There is no correct way of designing a microservices system um, as I've just laid this out, because that's not what microservices are. They weren't spawned in that way. The, the, the idea wasn't conceived like that. It was conceived as a, an architecture, as a philosophy, as a set of principles, rather than a set of explicit design patterns. And that's led to a problem, um, which I refer to as RPC-ish microservices. And we might have some dragons, or possibly HTTP, probably both. So what you probably do when you start to build a microservice system, and this is what many people do, is they will start to think in a particular direction. They will say, right, well, HTTP is totally easy. And it is. It really is easy to get going with. So let's use that. OK, fine. Well, let's, let's start mapping out our system. We've got orders. We want to show orders. We'll make a REST API, and we'll have an orders resource on it. OK, fine. Um, it seems to make sense that the orders resource is mapped onto its own data, so it has its own data in a local database. But when we want to get the product data associated with an order, should that be with the order? Well, no. No, we want, we want to isolate our system. We want to pull it apart. So let's pull it apart by having another resource for products. Then we can reuse it. And so we'll have a, a product service that hosts the product data. And then maybe we need to get access to user information um, from the order service to do authentication and various things like that. And so they, they should be in their own service as well. And so we'll have an auth service and a user's database uh, with a service wrapping around it, each, each with their own resourceful API on top. Perhaps we have a bit of fulfillment data um, so that we can get access to where is the uh, order service up to, sorry, where is a particular order up to? Has it been delivered? Is it going through the warehouse? What's going on? Um, so we'd probably want a fulfillment API, which would have its own database. This all seems to make sense. You can see the natural progression of building a system that looks just like this. So each of these has its own database. That gives us autonomy. We can change the data in this database whenever we want to. This appears to fulfill one of the principles that people will put forward as microservices, or auto deployment autonomy. This seems good. What happens if this happens? We have a network break, or one of the services goes down. It doesn't actually matter. From the point of view of the order service, it can't gain access to one of its dependencies anymore. The reason is irrelevant. What should, go, what should happen now? The best case, I think, is something like this. So you'll hear tell of something called a circuit breaker. And a circuit breaker is a logical component that sits inside a service and manages access to a dependency. And so what it, what it does is if it starts to detect that um, the responses coming back from a dependency are failing, it will stop trying and return intelligent default data. 
The idea behind that is to protect resources. It's to stop the order service being taken down catastrophically as well, because failure is expensive. Failure takes time to realize that it's happened, and that can very quickly, if your order system, order system is under load, if one of its dependencies goes down, the order service will go with it because you'll exhaust its thread pool or blow its memory or something like that. So you can intercept that kind of failure with, some, with something like a circuit breaker, but the best you can do in that case is return an error or return something dumb like this, um, where I've said, instead of having products, product data, you're just returning blank text, lorem ipsum. So this isn't, you know, no, no user is gonna be happy with that. Are you gonna return a 500 error? That kind of sucks, but it points to a problem, which is that this service, our order service, is broken. The actual order service is running. It's got its own data, but it's broken nonetheless because the product service is either gone down or we have a network break. So this points to an issue with this whole approach, which if we were to say guarantee five nines uptime for each one of our services, if you've got a decent infrastructure, decent ops team, that's what they should be aiming for, five nines uptime. Do you actually have five, five nines uptime on this service? On this system? No. No, you have four nines uptime at best because there's a multiplication effect going on. This relies on the five nines uptime of all of these others. If any one of these goes down, this is dead because we've arranged this into, into a dependency web. And this is, the, this is the inevitable result. You are guaranteed downtime just by breaking your system up. We've not talked about any benefits, but this is a massive flaw. You know, you talk about some um, organizations that say, oh yeah, we run 200 uh, microservices in production. It's like, oh yeah, how much damn time a month do you get? How many hours? Because that's, how, that's, that's the order that we're talking about. Hours of downtime, guaranteed. So, this seems a problem. You know, this is fragile. Uh, and this is not a good place to be in. Building fragile systems and, and knowing that they're going to be fragile, as you all now do, <laughs> isn't a good approach to life, certainly not software development. One thing I've not talked about is latency. Um, so HTTP is actually a fairly high latency approach. Um, for every one of those hops, you're looking at 10 milliseconds, 20 milliseconds, just for the HTTP negotiation. Um, that's not for data transfer, just for negotiation. So um, you, know, you make five hops deep, a human can see that, just for ne ne negotiation time. Um, which sucks, you know, that's not going to be a good system. Um, if there's any kind of load on the back-end system and you start to respond more slowly, then you're looking at seconds um, to kind of fulfill a request, just with a simple system like I've shown you. So this isn't a good way, this doesn't seem nice, but this isn't actually the worst problem. Um, the worst problem for me is that naturally, data is relational. And so could you imagine um, where you have an order and it needs to, well, say you wanted to run a query. Show me all of the orders that use this product ordered by user X. We've just joined all of those services, all of those databases together. We've tried to join them. And it leads to a problem that someone, I, I wish I could find who, who said this first, um, but what somebody called, gloriously called, inner join over HTTP. You know, trying to satisfy that query with, a, with these segmented siloed databases, um, you'll end up with tens of thousands of HTTP requests. Um, just for, for what in a relational database would have been an inner join and would have been a fraction of a second. So this, this kind of sucks. Um, and this all stems from a poor design decision. And that poor design decision stems from using what amounts to an RPC protocol in the form of HTTP. Now you can say, oh, it's RESTful or it's REST, and yeah, you're right, you know, REST adds good semantics, but it's still request, do some work, response, which is RPC. And if you aren't very, very careful, will lead to design decisions just like this. So going back to microservices and architecture, this is a rubbish architecture. Um, you know, whoever's the architect in, in charge of this, which happens to be me because I drew it, um, they've allowed bad things to happen to a system. And so this, this makes me tragically sad. So I came across this other thing called reactive. And who's ever heard the, the term reactive in terms of software? Some people? 
Reactive, did you know there was two? We actually have a naming clash, and it's terribly embarrassing um, because no one knows what I'm talking about, or they think I'm talking about one and I'm actually talking about the other. So I'll define both, and then we can talk. So um, if you've come across the reactive manifesto, then uh, what that is is a set of architectural principles. Um, so, and, and these are them. Um, and if you go onto the website, reactivemanifesto.org, which I strongly recommend, what you'll see there is a, uh, a set of definitions to say, well, we want to build systems that are responsive, resilient, elastic, and to do that, we're going to make them message-driven, and this is, this is what you should expect to see. Uh, and so what that lets you do, because they are architectural principles, they're a set of, um, uh, as, as we talked about before, it's akin to a philosophy. It's a way of thinking. So whenever you go in and make a design decision to apply this, this architecture, you say, is this making my system message-driven? Um, which is a fairly easy thing to identify. Is it making it more elastic? Is it making it more resilient? Is it making it more responsive? If it is, then yes, good, you're following the architecture. If it's not, possibly you need to consider other ways of doing it, or just do it anyway and know that you are working against the grain of the architecture. So this is what I would term, I would say I would term, this is what is generally termed reactive systems. Um, you're thinking about things at a systemic level, across the board, into process, all the rest of it. The other reactive is reactive programming. And this is the one that is currently more commonly known. Um, so reactive programming has a nice history. Um, it goes back to the 70s to uh, a, a paradigm called data flow. Hi. Um, and uh, essentially what it's talking about is creating pipelines of asynchronous dispatched events that can then be transformed, managed, sent forward, all these things, all these lots of good things. But the important thing here is that this is not an architecture. This is a, an implementation uh, approach. What you're doing is in your code, make, using this as a design. And you're saying, well, I, I can manage this as a flow of data rather than uh, imperatively or something like that. So it doesn't change things at the architectural level. So if you think about it this way, we're building a microservices system. We've got some components connected somehow. Um, reactive system is all of these things. How do they interoperate? Reactive programming. Inside each of these services, you can apply reactive programming if you so choose. Uh, and you're probably looking at something like RxJava or RxJS or something like that. So I want to talk about reactive systems. Um, lots of people have talked about reactive programming, and there's lots of good information on how to build reactive, reactive programming systems. No, that's totally the wrong thing to say. How to build, how to build systems how to build components using reactive programming. That's better. Um, now, building a reactive system, there's some things that you uh, fundamentally want to care about, which is data. Now, from the point of view of microservices, I think people get it quite wrong in that they start to think about what are the processes? What are the components? What are the microservices? Um, that's not how distributed systems work, not really. Um, you need to care about the data. You need to care about how the data's moving. You need to care about how it's synchronizing. You need to care about how it's kept consistent, how you arrange it for query, things like that. Um, those are the things that you really need to care about when you're building a distributed system, because that's where your problems will come. Um, you know, my, my inner join over HTTP, that was, a, that was a data problem, not a resource design problem. So you need to care about data. And the fundamental problem is you have some data here in one service, and you need it in another service at some point um, to perform some operation, to perform some query. Doesn't really matter. This is, this is always the problem. Now, you could use RPC, in which case our angry dragon appears again because we've just used RPC. Um, now, using RPC is not in itself a bad thing. It's what design decisions does that lead you to make in terms of your data architecture. Some other options that I'll just skip through. Uh, we could. Uh, the phrase I'll use is materialize a view. Um, I've been accused of been, been, being too deep into the Oracle world because I'm using that, because that's apparently a phrase they use in Oracle. Um, but it's not. Um, what I'm using is a, is a data synchronization uh, phrase. We have some data here. We ought to create some view of that data over here, and we keep that consistent by doing a push. 
um, rather than a pull like RPC. So that can help, that's good. Um, maybe we want to do scatter gather. We have all of our services there, we just blow out a message saying, I'm interested in this, someone please send it to me. And then at some point you get a, a message back or you don't. Um, but you aren't tied to where the data is. You have, uh, you've, you've liberated your system from knowing where everything is. It's a, a broadcast pub sub type approach. Another one that we may look at if we have time is event logs. Um, this is where you can persist your data um, in some external stream of, data, stream of events and start to do interesting things with it. Some of these are options. All of them require you to think about data, not about components. Um, and that's the big switch that you need to make. If you, if you, I believe if you want to do microservices correctly, you need to start thinking in terms of data, not, not bits, not runtimes. Um, which is one of the reasons why the great big focus on containerization um, actually is missing the point. You know, you need automation, you really do. And lots of the containerization tech is great, um, but it's not the fundamental problem when you want to build a distributed system. So there's lots of reactive techs available. Um, who would say they work in the JVM? Some people, one. JavaScript, more. Any, something else. What do, you, what do you guys work in? Uh, Python, and Go. Python, Go. Any, any others? Is that? PHP. PHP. OK. So here's some from the um, uh, JVM world and others. Um, .NET down there. Um, so there's some technologies that you can use, that you can apply. All of these fit the idea of being part of a reactive system. They're all message-based. They're all scalable. They're all resilient. Um, so. Uh, pick one of these, perhaps, but there seems to be a problem. Most systems aren't like this. They're definitely not. If you have followed my thread um, and are kind of getting with me on the reactive systems are great, why haven't they won? You know, there's something, there's something preventing reactive systems winning. Otherwise, people would just download Kafka build a reactive system, and well, hey, we're, we've got all the benefits that David has just told us about. But that's not happening. You know, some places are doing it, but it's not winning. Fundamentally, most people build RPC-ish microservices when they're doing it. You know, that's certainly my experience. That's what people do, which is great for my revenue stream. It's brilliant. I can go in and say, um, well, people call me and say, oh, we've, we're not getting the benefits of microservices, is what they always argue. And it's like, well, yeah, because you've just designed it very badly. Um, you've done it wrong. Um, but fundamentally, there's something gone missing, which is preventing um, us getting the benefits. And I've thought about this, and it's taken me quite a long time to realize what's gone, what's actually missing, um, which, which is this, the idea of APIs. So we say API, and what we probably mean is HTTP in terms of networked APIs. So I'm not talking about um, calling some C library. I'm saying on a network, if you have an API, you probably expect to get REST or something like that. Or if you're really new, GraphQL. So we have this idea that APIs are synonymous with HTTP. If we take away, I oh, know, so if we um, look at an API, it's not actually the API that we care about. It's not, it's not HTTP that gives us the good feelings. It's all the things that we've put around HTTP. The fact that you can go to a REST API and actually you're given a link to a Swagger doc. That can be interesting. That's good. It gives you a lot of information. Or whatever other document that you've got um, that's, that's kind of uh, allows you to generate a client. Um, the fact that HTTP is utterly ubiquitous. That helps. That's good. Um, the fact that we can very easily mock and stub and test against HTTP APIs as our, as our dependencies. There's lots of tech out there. That's great. All of these things are the good things about HTTP um, in terms of building microservices, building distributed systems. These are really good. And so uh, the top one is, is one that's often missed as well. So I say a well-defined technical integration interaction model. What I mean by that is that we have a client, it knows exactly how to talk to a server, because there's only one way. You send a request, 
with some kind of re, uh, request document, you get a response document, you do something with it. Um, that's it. You know, it's, it's a very simple model, but it's there. It's always there. Uh, and we can just totally rely on it. So this is the thing that's gone missing. You know, if you start to adopt a reactive model, a messaging model, you know, is there any defined interaction that you can think of? You know, I send a message, what happens next? It's totally wild west. You know, it's, it's just utterly undefined. You have to know exactly what the service that you're talking to is going to do, probably by reading its code. Um, and so this is missing, this whole concept. And so if we take away HTTP, then all of these things, all of these good, good things go with it. So that's fundamentally what is happening with Reactive at the moment. We're adopting messaging, but we're losing APIs in the process. And that's a big loss. That's hard. So what will probably happen if you, if you kind of overlook this and say, right, we're going to go all in with Kafka. Kafka is going to be our data backbone. Um, then probably what will happen is that instead of having APIs back, what you'll use is Kafka as your API. And so someone will say something along the lines of, um, there is a stream of data there, there's a queue there, um, with all of this data on it, it looks like this, you can replay it from, from there. And so you can just go and get all of our data, pull it off, that's all fine. You don't care what's putting the data on the queue. Um, and so what you're doing there is using Kafka as an API, which may be a valid choice. But it becomes a strategic choice. It becomes a big choice. You know, if you start using Kafka as your API, then 15 years from now, you're going to be in the same position with Kafka as a couple of years ago, companies were with Oracle, paying big license fees, big management fees, whatever the fees, big fees to contractors. Money is going to be exchanged hands in a big way, um, and you ain't ever going to get it out of your system, um, just like Oracle is right now. So. If you're in a position to influence this, are you happy with this? You know, kind of microservices, the idea is you shouldn't make strategic choices unless you have no other choice. Um, and so we're left in a position where we're making a big strategic choice if we want to go reactive. Otherwise, we build this, these RPC-ish entity-based microservices that means that we can't really do queries across the system anymore uh, because we've got this HTTP in a joint nightmare. So this kind of sucks. Um, I'm not happy with this. And so this led me to a thought, which if we want to build reactive APIs, message-based APIs that kind of help you to build all of these other things out, could we reintroduce this concept? Could we create this thing called message, called reactive APIs, message-based APIs? Um, and so that fundamentally is, is, is where I've been heading over the past couple of years, trying to pin this down. So imagine this, try this on. Um, we want to create the same idea that we have in HTTP in terms of APIs, but we want to do that in a message-based world. So here we have our client and our uh, server again, our API that we're talking to. You could imagine building a messaging-based system that kind of looks like this. So we have a request, I want to trade X for Y, this comes back with a counter negotiation. So it doesn't just say, here's your response. There's a conversation happens. And conversations are really, really well represented in messaging. So it gives them a choice. Do you want this or do you want this? It says, right, I'll, I'll take this in 10 minutes. So there's a wait, there's a pause, and then data starts to flow when it's available. And then at some point, our client says, this is too fast, please slow down your data. Um, and then I can consume it without overwhelming my memory or whatever. So this, in terms of messaging, would be fairly straightforward to make. But it's not an API. This is just messaging. Um, if we want to have an API, we need to try and get the things that we were looking at before that I stitched around HTTP. So I was looking at problems like this. So I often build systems that look very much like this. And... Um, what I noticed was that there was a, a mix of messages here. Um, often, will people, often people will um, just have what I term domain messages. So it's a, uh, ones that actually make sense to the business. 
Um, but also very often, they will slip in something else, which is what I did at the end, the slow down message. That has no business meaning whatsoever. Um, it's purely, hi. Um, that message is purely uh, coordination between the services, nothing more. Um, it's what we would term back pressure. It's a client saying to the server, stop overwhelming me. You're sending too much data. No business value, um, but certainly, certainly good technical value. And so that struck me. That's what HTTP does. Now, this is actually what, what the HTTP model is. It has your domain kind of content, which is your request payload and your response payload. But it's got a whole technical setup around it. You know, the fact that you make a request and a response HTTP doesn't give a damn what your business is. Um, you know, kind of building a REST API on top of HTTP, that's a good idea. It works very well. HTTP still doesn't care. And so there is this mix. There's a technical level of HTTP, and then there's the domain level of HTTP that you add on top. And so it struck me. We have these technical messages in our uh, kind of messaging scheme they kind of fulfill a similar idea to the request and response headers, the kind of the format of the request and the response, um, and the fact that there is a request and a response. They kind of feel the same. We have this technical interaction going on that are porting domain messages over the top. And so this got me, this got me thinking. Um, this is the line I followed. In here, I can identify two reusable technical things. There's the domain messages, but in there, what we have is a negotiation and then client-managed streaming. And that's all that there really is. There's, there's this, I want to trade something for something kind of negotiation going on. And then this one down here is, right, I want that data and I want you to send it to me as fast as I, I want, not as fast as you want. Those are the two technical pieces here. The domain stuff is on top, or it could be. And so that, that fundamental thing where we can identify technical messages and use those in a reusable way, um, I think is the, the hook for our question, which is, could we build a reactive API? Could we build a message-based API? That's the base level, reusable technical interaction models um, is the phrase I'm using. I think I need a better phrase. But we actually want all of these things around it. Um, you know, all the good things from the HTTP API world, this is what we really want. This is, if we had these, maybe HTTP wouldn't be our first choice. Maybe we could use something else that's based on messaging and gives us the advantages of that. And that fundamentally is a very long-winded introduction to what the Muon project was designed for. Um, this is the problem that we've been looking at. And we have been attempting to come up with a solution kind of along the lines of what I've just described. Um, and so, to give you an example of the kind of things you can start to do um, with this kind of approach. Imagine you have a Mongo. Who's ever used Mongo? Did you like it? Yes, it is. So Mongo solved the developer experience problem. Um, it was very, very good, very easy to get going. Um, don't ever let your system get into a position where it's got an even number of nodes. So, Mongo. The thing that I like about Mongo is they very recently implemented a, um, a, streaming, uh, a streaming driver in the JVM world, in Java. What that allows you to do is from your application, control how fast the data flows from Mongo. So your application doesn't have to buffer all of the data into, into memory to then process it. Nice approach. But there's a problem. We have our service, a microservice, or whatever. Um, we have a browser. If we were to load some data, make a big query in Mongo, do some processing in here, and then go into the browser, it will buffer. Um, and buffering is, is very bad. Um, buffering leads to very spiky behavior. Buffering can blow your memory. Um, buffering can do terrible things to your system. Um, at the very least, it increases latency. Um, if you have, say, half a million records that you want to lift off disk and stream them down to a browser, you're gonna to have to pause until you can load all the data in, in here so you can then start throwing it down. Not ideal. And the real problem is not here, it's here. 
There's no way of controlling how fast that data flows um, down to the browser. So, some solutions, potentially. Um, we could use WebSocket. Who's ever used WebSockets? Yeah, they're quite straightforward, aren't they? Kind of not bad. Imagine trying to handle back pressure, so controlling how fast the data is flowing from the browser. Imagine if you need to implement this again. So you, we've solved that problem, we've made it work, but now you need to do it again. Um, do we implement it a second time in our new service, in our new browser client? Um, do we attempt to reuse it? We're kind of in the realms of an API here. You know, kind of, we want to do streaming, client-managed streaming, back pressure. And so this is where Muon fits, this kind of problem. You've got a technical problem, which in this case is we want to control how fast the data is flowing. Um, we know we can orchestrate that using messages, um, which is a message to say, I'm ready for more data now, effectively. Um, but we want to make that reusable and have a nice API on top of it. And so the way that Muon works is we have our application code that uses an API. In this case, I know there's some data there and I want to control how fast it goes. Uh, internally, what it does is um, work as a messaging protocol. So a protocol uh, in any system is a, essentially a state machine um, saying that, yes, I'm ready to receive data now in this case, um, or I'm subscribing, or I'm doing this, or whatever it's doing. So from this level, this level on, it's exchanging data using messages, well-defined messages. From your application code, you don't actually need to see that. Um, you're just using some piece of code that promises to stream data and not overwhelm you. And so this is what we built. Uh, Muon is a toolkit for building message APIs. This is one of them. There are a bunch of others. So different technical problems that can be solved in a generic way using messaging. Um, this particular one, um, has anyone come across reactive streams before? Possibly, no, no, one. Well done, that man. So this is one of the great things that's came out, uh, come out of the JVM recently um, in terms of collaboration. Uh, in the JVM world, we have a bunch of different, we're blessed really um, by streaming systems. So we have things like Acker and uh, Rx Java and Spring Reactor and lots of different systems that can stream data and do reactive programming on them um, for a lot, to a large extent. So they can create a pipeline and do transformations and all kinds of cool things. If you, though, have, say, an Acker system and you want to do some transformation using Rx Java, um, but you want to allow Rx Java to control how fast the data flows, there's something of a problem. Um, which is how do you connect the two? Uh, and so that's where reactive streams came in. Uh, came in. It was a, a set of interfaces that have a bunch of methods that, can, that uh, define signals between the two implementations. So um, in, in our case, on Acker we can implement it, in RxJava we can implement it, and that becomes our common interface that allows them to plug together, and then RxJava could, can send signals to Acker to say, yes, you can send more data now. So we've got back pressure signals going backwards and forwards. Now, whenever you hear the word signal, that's a message. Um, it just so happens that in reactive streams, it's a method call, but it doesn't really matter. It's a message. And so what we did was to take this scheme, see all of the method calls on it, and say, these are our messages. If we implement this, then what we can do is to connect Acker over here in one process, RxJava over here in another process, and bridge a network using messaging. They would never know the difference. More importantly though, those messages are well-defined. We know what's in them. So we can take those messages and implement them in any other language, say Node, or in a browser, or in Rust, or in whatever we want to. So we can then get the benefits and say, well, from a Node application or a browser application, we can connect to RxJava over here and pull data down and control back pressure because we've defined all the messages, defined all the schemes that this can send backwards and forwards. And so in terms of messages, these are what we're looking at. We have a, some kind of server that defined, that has all of these messages on. Um, the client will send a subscrip subscription. The server will say, yes, your subscription is live. The client will then start to request data and data will come down. Um, there's a bunch of other messages depending on where in the uh, state machine the, the protocol is. 
The point is, though, this can be implemented in any language, and you gain access to streaming um, over an arbitrary transport. So it could be WebSockets, it could be MQP, it could be TCP. So long as you can send these messages from this service to this service, it doesn't really matter. And so this lets us do some interesting things. So if we were to look at Java, um, I don't have a JS implement, uh, implementation of this to show you um, this evening. So this is a piece of Java code, and what it does is to create a muon, implement, a muon instance, at, create a reactive stream server. So this then uh, creates the endpoints available. Um, we do a big query using Mongo, which gives us a publisher, which is the reactive streams interface. Doesn't really matter. We then use um, our reactive stream server, that should be rx.publish source, give it a name, and then give it our publisher. Someone can then come along later on, uh, subscribe to that, and gain the data being pu published, being, being pu uh, streamed down to them from any language. Um, this, is, this is the code. From the point of view of Node, which some of you are probably more familiar with, you can subscribe to that like this. Um, so you just know what the logical name of the service is, ask for a particular endpoint, uh, pass some parameters if you want to, uh, in this case none, and this will control, in the background, this is requesting data 10 at a time. Um, you can control that more precisely if you want to, um, but for the purposes of the slides, we're not. Um, so this will never be overwhelmed by the, by the server, and it will control how fast the data uh, is pulled off, off of Mongo, because the back pressure signals are going all the way from the browser through our Java service down to Mongo. And so we won't get any buffering. We won't get a saturated network. Um, we can have much tighter control over how our data is flowing, which is helpful in this case. Now, from the point of view of how we make this work, we have multiple WebSockets. That's not scalable. Um, if we wanted to have multiple endpoints, browsers actually have a limit as to how many WebSockets they can have open, and it's not very high. Um, it depends on the browser, somewhere between two and 10 or something like that. Um, so we don't want that. Now this, this is just messaging. You know, if we're gonna use Muon on this, which is a WebSocket, which you totally can, and I'll show you, this is just messaging. And what we have in the Muon data schema is enough information to route things. So what we can do is to put a gateway in, a router. So you can have just one WebSocket open. And from your code, you could say subscribe to service A and service B, being service A and service B. And this could then very easily route between them. And so it will happily multiplex and all, all the good things. Uh, and you can control data from both of these Mongos using the code I showed you before over a single WebSocket. I'm obviously not happy with RPC. I think messaging gives a better, uh, a better approach to building distributed systems. Um, but as of right now, um, messaging is missing the concept of the API. Um, and so we just end up with ad hoc messaging that means that your systems aren't replaceable or not easily replaceable because they become overly entangled based on the messaging logic. Um, I think that Muon can give a solution to that. Um, that's what it was built for. That's what it was aimed at. Um, so I think this is the kind of thing that you want to think about uh, in terms of building messaging systems, um, this concept of the API. Uh, there is more things that I haven't talked about, uh, more things that I haven't touched on. I do have a whole arc on events and event systems and event logs um, that I could go through, um, but it would take about another 40 minutes. Um, so I'm not going to do that now because of time. Um, but there are more APIs. You know, even the ones that I've just shown you, there are more. So the RPC, streaming events, there's more um, that we can do. Different technical implementations of things, common patterns that are implemented in messaging. Um, that we can then make very portable across languages. Um, that's what I want. Uh, Transport-wise, I showed you AMQP and WebSockets. Again, there are more. Um, we can go across TCP. Um, I would love to go across more, but uh, no one has paid me to do that yet. Uh, we've not gone on a, on a project that needed it. Uh, but we certainly can. Uh, I don't care about your infrastructure. Uh, if you want to run this on Kubernetes, uh, AWS, EC2, um, Cloud Foundry, anything. You know, it's, uh, it doesn't actually matter. And yes, if you want to, if, if, if this interests you, um, come to the website, sign up for Slack, have a chat. Um, it's probably the best way. Um, yeah, so um, any questions? 
example at the beginning, you gave, uh, for example, coffee speed and all the problems that that has. Um, if you're doing, say, a restful kind of web service, perhaps. Um, as you were talking about that, I was thinking the easy way to solve most of the problems is caching. Because uh, most of these things we're going to be read only like if you've got a product database, for example. But what do you think about that as a solution? Um, it's, it's certainly a well understood way of doing things. Um, the issues with caching are uh, understanding caching validation um, and TTLs. Um, but it's, it's a, a fairly reasonable way of doing it. It doesn't quite solve the, um, uh, you want to do a query uh, and join all of the data stores. Um, because it's, do you put that cache data into a data store for query? Uh, in which case, you're actually starting to, uh, well, if you're, if you're putting that data into a data store for query, and then you're doing uh, optimistic invalidation, um, so you, you're using a push to invalidate data, you've effectively built a shonky version of what I've just described. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's a good approach. It's a good, good technique um, if you can understand your data well enough to apply it, and you probably should. So, yeah. In your uh, initial, I think it was your first diagram when you were talking about the HTTP RPC between your services, um, you had one service dependent on another, and you said if the service, if, if the service right at the back died, um, your service that you're hitting initially uh, will no longer send, no, will no longer respond with valid requests because the service that's dependent on it has died. Does this yep. help with that at all? The problem there is you have isolated your data and given it one place that it lives. Um, so you've said, right, I have product data. Naturally, the product data lives in a product service. Whenever you want product data, you should go and get it from there. Caching aside, which is a very good point. Um, so the solution, I would, I would argue, is if you have your data arranged in a different way. Um, so I would personally arrange data probably in some kind of event stream of updates. Um, an, an event stream of updates synchronizes very, very easily. And you can take that event stream of updates and play it into more than one place. So you could have a product service that allows you to do querying on the products. But you could also take that same product data and put it into your orders database and have a mechanism for keeping it synchronized, which is the problem. Um, that's why people reach for RPC, because synchronization is a hard problem. Um, but if you have an approach for it, which event logs is, is kind of one of my favorite data structures, they give you an approach for it. So that would be my solution, something like that. You kind of said that Oracle was not really great. And you I didn't say that. Okay. So SAP kind of. Yep. Um, so would uh, a customer choose your um, solution or your architecture over kind of presumably because of price, or are you arguing that just fundamentally your the architecture you described is better? Hannah's an interesting one. Do you work for SAP? Or no. okay. So. Um, I'm not going to rag on SAP, by the way. That was just a curious, curious question. So I'll start with Oracle. I didn't, I di I didn't criticize Oracle in terms of feature sets. Um, Oracle is a, a very full-featured database, and it does some very, very cool things. Um, it's just gloriously expensive and hard to uh, renegotiate with the sales guys. Um, something I would probably put SAP into as well, something similar like that. Uh, but SAP HANA is a, an interesting, very interesting approach to solving this problem. Um, I'd say that HANA's problems are not actually the data architecture problems, because SAP, they do understand data um, quite well. Um, HANA's problems are the, the dev experience and the price. Um, so the dev experience of HANA, in my, to my understanding, having worked with a couple of teams that have, that have used it and trialed it, um, it is that uh, the documentation is, is not always great. Um, the actual approaches to problems have been partially implemented. And so you end up with um, kind of what was fundamentally a good idea has been taken in an odd direction by the team that actually implemented it. Um, so that aside, HANA is a very interesting approach. It, it does implement many of the same ideas that I've been presenting. Um, kind of if you've not come across HANA, it's a, essentially an in-memory data grid that allows you to materialize data and do kind of event-based synchronization, all kinds of cool things. Um, and it certainly does scale well. So I mean, I, I would say, 
uh, it, it's not a this versus that. I'm proposing an API, um, which Hannah isn't. Hannah is proposing a full stack solution without APIs cutting through it. Um, I'm proposing something cutting through your system, which is the concept of an API. Good question, though. As a front end developer, yep. how would I interact with this API? Would I need to know about how the back end is architected? Would I need to know what services I'm querying uh, in, in a sort of system by system, uh, on a system, by system basis? Or would it be um, also um, on visual, like you sort of rest work by resources? Mm -hmm. That's very intelligible to a front end. That is a design decision, and it's a great question, because um, there you're into what API design is. Um, so to give you a practical example, I recently built a, um, I was working with a team building a, uh, what amounts to a shopping cart. Um, it's a, um, an online social shopping thing. It was quite, it was, it's a cool project. Um, so what we did there was create one service, which was the fronting service, the API. Um, and it was just API slash whatever. Um, devs can then introspect that, like you saw. They can see all the resources, get various documentation on the resources. One of the things I didn't show you is getting the schema information. So you can see what data can go in and out of those uh, API endpoints. Um, so that kind of, that solves the discovery problem um, that you're kind of talking, uh, kind of, well, talking to. Um, some of the things that you can do from the front end point of view, um, you gain access to different types of API. So this, I mean, you can still use HTTP, of course, um, but there's things like streaming or events um, or scattergather or things like that. Um, you can start to use those from a front end point of view. Uh, so one example is a shopping basket. Um, often you want to uh, create a, say if you're using something like React or uh, view or something like that. Um, one of the interesting things about those technologies is that they have a, a, a good idea of, well, no, sorry, sorry, they have a strong opinion on what direction data should go, which is one way, so top to bottom. Um, streaming fits that perfectly. So if you have a streaming endpoint, tap that into, say, a Redux state tree or something like that, the data then just flows from the server all the way through, ripples through the, the GUI. And so you can cut great big chunks out of, out of GUIs because it just becomes simpler to reason about data. There's no con constant backwards and forwards polling, those kind of things. Um, they start to go away. Um, so I realize I've done the consultant thing and talked around your question. Um, but the, the answer is probably, you know, you still need to do good API design. I think that there, will, is, there is currently, obviously, less uh, established wisdom as, as to what you can do with this, as, a, as to compared with REST, what you gain is extra capability um, in terms of the interactions that you can, you can do. Can I follow on that? Of course you can. Um, so GraphQL sounds like it fits exactly what that, that problem space. Yep. Um, have you had any experience implementing it, and what would you recommend? GraphQL? Yes. Um, hmm. So this is a good question. We haven't integrated it with Muon, as things stand right now. Um, I, I desperately want to. I'm just finding space. Um, I kind of have to find some space. So if, you've, if anyone's not come across, gra across GraphQL before, um, the problem it solves is essentially API evolution and managing, um, uh, managing data. So it allows clients to define their own API to a large extent by defining a, quite a cool execution engine or execution model on the back end. Um, it's somewhat orthogonal to uh, the fact that most people send it over HTTP. Um, you know, you could take that same GraphQL engine and attach it to a streaming API, and you would get something intelligent back. Um, so every time something in the graph updated, you could imagine getting an update. Um, that would certainly work. Um, I, haven't, I haven't done that. Um, I'd love to give you a good solid answer as to what that feels like. Um, I can imagine it's great. I just have the time. Yes. Uh, yes. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, I just wanted to ask um, with your example of the Java service you created with um, reading from a MongoDB collection. Yep. If, for example, I wanted to scale that up and run ten instances of it, how would the load balancing work? 
Um, so the, the way that the load balancing currently works, you have two options. One is to um, switch off any kind of multiplexing from the gateway. So the gateway can then connect to uh, the various backends without any multiplexing, at which point you would balance per connection, round robin effectively. Um, the other option is you can switch on multiplexing, which allows you to control, well, allows you to route many connections over a single backend pipe, which is far more performant in terms of latency. There's no establishing of a connection. Um, but the round robin behavior um, currently isn't working great. Um, it mostly works, but there's a bit of work to be done, uh, in, specifically with Node, with the Node implementation, which the gateway is written in. Um, so it's, it's, what we're aiming for is a pluggable algorithm to allow you to control the balancing. We haven't got that there yet, um, specifically with Node. So that's, but that's where we're aiming. Sorry. Um, so how would someone combine this architecture with sort of large static uh, da data sets? So for example, in your, um, in your orders example, imagine if they had physical stores that they might want to display to the user, and that doesn't really change. Do they save that in a separate database outside of the reactive <laughs> structure? Yes, I mean, it, it very much depends on your data. Um, if you actually do have data that doesn't change very much, um, there's no point in, in creating a, a, a published model like I'm talking about here. Um, but there's another question, which is how are you going to use that data? Um, so as an example, um, a lot of data can be queried relationally, but some questions need to be answered by loading it into a graph model or something like that. Um, having some way of synchronizing those data between the two data models, uh, it we're back into the world of reactive um, and messaging. So it's, um, it's a broader discussion. Um, and sometimes the solution is leave it in MySQL. MySQL is really cool. Um, but sometimes it's not. What's the native communication protocol that Neon uses? Uh, it's pluggable. So it's um, defined as a, in both implementations, there's a, a well defined interface um, that says, I want to open a channel to service A, um, and then starts to throw messages over them, over the channel. Uh, how that channel is created is something that is um, uh, open to the developer. The ones that we have available right now um, are over AMQP, which uses paired queues to model the channel connection, um, WebSockets, and then TCP. Um, and so they, they kind of do their own management of uh, how those messages are serialized and sent. Okay, so you could plug in, like, present protocols or... Yep, absolutely. So in terms of serialization, um, the ones that we've got built in right now are JSON and Avro. Um, putting it into protobuf would totally work. Um, it's, it's, uh, there's, there's space in all of the designs to do that. We just have never found a need because I, I quite like Avro. You mentioned something about the HTTP being easy to monitor and test and conquer. Yep. Do you have certain facilities for this as well? Some of the cool things that you can do um, are, uh, because we have uh, the idea of a, a well-defined API for messaging, uh, implementing that as a, um, well, sorry, well-defined API for messaging and pluggable transport. So you can get your service, connect it to an in-memory transport that can s send messages around, plug a whole variety of different um, services that from the point of view of the service under test, um, is uh, they're, they're available over the network, just like in the real system, and do quite a broad, what looks like a simulation. Um, but all of these are, are stubs, and they're just returning stub data. Um, so creating those kind of stubs is really easy. Um, in terms of monitoring, um, all the data is going over a, uh, a channel, and you can tap that channel and um, pull it out, yeah. Um, and then use that for whatever you want to. Um, so yeah, you could pipe it off to, to Prometheus or whatever. If you have an application that uses a normal relational database, has been developed for 18 years or something, how would you change it? How would it change it architecturally? Um, that's a broad question that probably needs more information. Um, Let's say Oracle database, normal spring application, model Does it need to change? Well, the client wants it to change. OK. Um, let's pick that up. <laughs> let's pick that up. Um, any, any other questions? It would, yes. Um, so I have been monitoring the developments 
Um, at the moment, we've got WebSockets very happy with it. Um, we're probably going to look at, uh, see if we can piggyback on gRPC um, for that reason. So but it's not something that anyone has asked us for yet. Um, so we've not been done. But it's certainly possible. I mean, so long as you've got the bi-directional uh, communication between, between services, it, it, it works. It doesn't have to be bi-directional. I mean, SSD can work as well, as long as you don't really want something back from the browser or the client. Potentially. Um, it's a potential thing. At the moment, the model is bi-directional. Um, we could, in certain circumstances, relax that. We haven't found an API that required it as yet. Um, for reasons I, I, can, I can go into, but uh, it would take a, a long and in-depth technical stuff. Uh, well, it's not that long, but it's, it's uh, possibly not for, not for upfront. Um, any more questions? Does it handle things like reconnections on connection to our parts? Yes, it does. Um, the uh, philosophy that it implements is failure happens, everyone should know that. Um, and so if a failure occurs, uh, data traffic that was um, in a pipe uh, during the failure is lost. We don't even attempt to keep it. Um, and we uh, start screaming to application code to say, data's, not got, data's gone missing, you need to handle this problem. Um, everything else, uh, all the other schemes that people implement, they look like they work, they look like they recover from failure. They've all got really scary edge cases that appear under load. So I don't like that because I've, I've been bitten by them too many times. So we haven't taken that as a position. Uh, one last question, if you don't mind. Yeah, sure. Um, with, with the with Node.js, um, I saw, well, I saw in JavaScript anyway that you were using the callback model, so you had the error callback as well as uh, on data callback. Yep. Um, do you have any sort of implementation for Node.js streams like API? Not yet, no. That is one thing we have been asked for. Um, we've just, uh, the, the guy who wrote most of the node code um, had a baby, so he's not quite got the time um, to kind of put that in, but that's something that is, is, we really, really want to, because um, especially with the newer nodes, it's, it's very good now. Okay, all right, well, uh, thank you very much for coming. And um, yeah.